Okay, welcome back. Thanks for uh, watching online, and we're back now with uh, Dr. Rick Nabb and uh, Greg Mant with the Gozar program. And so now we'd like to take your questions. Uh, Sarah Perfader, who's our social uh, media producer and meteorologist, also has a couple of questions that she's going to ask first, and then I'll just work my way around the room for any other questions. And this session will last as long as we have questions. So if we have two, that'll be it. If we have uh, ten, uh, that'll be it. So here we go. Sarah. For Dr. Nab, and that is, what's been the general response to the new uh, watch warnings uh, surge risk products that you're going to be putting out? And do you believe that the general feedback will increase preparedness or decrease preparedness, especially for those who are outside of the marked regions? Okay, so we've already started to have some conversations with our emergency management partners, for example, on how it went last year during Hurricane Arthur when the potential storm surge flooding map made its debut. And we've gotten some very generalized positive feedback and some specific feedback about some of the, uh, the, the challenges or the issues uh, going forward. You know, once you pr produce a product that pr provides that level of detail in the storm surge potential, uh, which is very different than the paradigm we've had before in terms of what we've been communicating and what they've been using to make their evacuation decisions, it brings forth new challenges. But th those, are, those are good problems to have. And we're going to be spending this entire hurricane off season at the various meetings and conferences uh, and with emergency managers who, including as we speak right now, are at the hurricane center going through training courses on our products and giving us their feedback. Uh, we're going to be going through specific challenges and specific issues they have with using that product for their decision making. Uh, maybe some of the folks in the room who, who saw or used the product in real time would, would want to give their opinions. I know I saw it on both national and local uh, television outlets. Uh, from what I saw on television, it was a, a very compelling way to communicate the, uh, the storm surge risk on television. Uh, but we are just beginning the several month hurricane off season period, which is our core part of the year to get feedback on what we did last year and factor that into year two of that product being experimental uh, this coming year. And we'll do the same thing with that experimental watch warning graphic that starts this year. Okay, so my next question is for uh, Greg Mant, and the question is, SpaceX is currently undergoing NASA certification for launching Jason 2. Does that help NOAA potentially for future launches? I assume those are going to be bid out eventually? We buy our launch vehicles off of the NASA NLS uh, launch service contract, and so for us, we will have to wait for SpaceX to actually get on that. So the NASA processes of getting that on that launch uh, thing will affect our ability to purchase those services. For us, though, we need certainly their heavy version to get uh, a spacecraft our, our size up to uh, geosynchronous altitude. All right. Greg, you mentioned earlier that you already had sensors built and in storage for S and T. So that means that the baseline of capability is going to be exactly the same for these three vehicles, or are we looking for any kind of improvement in those sensors? Yeah, that was, that's a good question. That was a point I, I meant to make. The downside of buying four satellites at once is you get that capability. And if you look to where U goes out to, do you know what year that was? 2038. So in a sense, that's the goes, this is what you have for this. So other systems or other capabilities, we're going to have to look for ways, you know, hosted payloads or other things to find ways to get additional capability on. Okay. Certainly there's possibilities to add it, but that gets very, very expensive once you've built something to try to add, make a change to it. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Nev Howard Bernstein, WSA. One of my followers in Washington wants to know if this hurricane season is going to wreak havoc yet. Do we have any ideas? It's just too early. I don't think it's an answerable question, but it was asked, so I will pass that along. Even folks who have studied how to go about doing seasonal hurricane forecasting a lot longer than I have stopped putting out seasonal forecasts in December a little while ago. So uh, clearly that's a sign that it's even quite a bit early here in January to even give a, a reliable uh, idea uh, of what kind of overall season we're going to have. Now, I always say, to go directly to the question, 
there's a huge difference between how busy a hurricane season might be overall and how bad it might be in any one location. 1992. That gets to, and that gets to what kind of havoc our hurricanes going to wreak this year. I, I'm pretty sure there'll be a hurricane or more this coming hurricane season, but where they go, we have absolutely no way of telling at this particular moment. And, and we've seen, as you just mentioned, 1992, overall below average year, you have a devastating hurricane in South Florida. And we've had way above average years like 2010, and not one hurricane comes ashore in the US. Well, so you know what? I don't know. Fair enough. Let me ask you this that you may also not know, being in the mid-Atlantic, and obviously Sandy a couple years ago was a big, big event. Do you foresee more Sandys? I and if so, do you have any idea of the frequency of that occurrence? Right. I went up to uh, New York, New Jersey uh, within the, a few months after Sandy had struck. And the, the main topic of conversation on one day that I went up there was whether or not this could happen again. Was this the worst we've ever experienced? And we only have to look to hurricane history to realize that we don't have a good handle on the frequency of rare extreme events. Look at how busy 2004 and 2005 were in the state of Florida and other parts of the US. And then since then, no major hurricanes by the category three or stronger making landfall. And in, but still we've had major impacts in, in areas that hadn't been impacted in a long time. Hi hurricane history teaches us that you can get hit last year and get hit again this year. Or you can get hit last year and then go a long time without getting hit again. The answer is we don't know. So it's just all is, dumb luck? But the answer, well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of chaos in the historical record of, of hurricanes and other rare events to the point where we can't put a number on how long it's going to be before it happens again. You can only look back in history to see how frequent it has been overall, but that doesn't put you off the hook for next year, whether you were hit last year. Bermuda could get hit again next year. And Savannah, Georgia, that hasn't had a big direct hit since the late 1800s, could get hit next year, too. So th there's no using past history to tell you what next year will be like. It doesn't put you on the hook. It doesn't take you off. I mean, with that being said, you've had a tremendous amount of coastal development, uh, real estate, you know, housing, that sort of thing, over the past you know, 50 years in this country. And we know it's just a matter of time. And you, you can't really dissuade people from wanting to build something nice on the ocean. Right, and the, the fact that more and more people and stuff are in harm's way in our coastal regions is all the more reason to take steps to be as prepared as we can be for next year if your location is struck. Because if you hang your hat on, well, it's been 40 years, so that, that this isn't a problem here, or if you take the opposite uh, uh, rationale, but come to the same conclusion to say, well, I got hit last year, so I'm off the hook this year. We, we do it both ways. We, we, we try to cheat nature either way, but we can't play that game because we don't know where the hurricanes are going to hit next year. And even if you've uh, been hit recently or not in your lifetime, you could be hit next year. And I wish there was another way to deal with this nasty beast called the hurricane that is extremely destructive, but very rare in any one location. You know, so you have to, you know, the mantra, the mantra is, is the way to go. You prepare every year as if it's your year where you live. That's the only thing I know how to do where I, living in South Florida. Okay, this one is also for Dr. Nab, and uh, this viewer is actually in Estonia. Uh, and so his question is, uh, in previous hurricane seasons, I've noticed the track cuts off at zero degrees. I remember Katia caused problems in 2011. So what is the forecast track policy for tropical cyclones that would cross the zero degree meridian as extra tropical within five days yet have an identity? Right, well, yeah, Katia affected Europe uh, as a post-tropical cyclone. That was after it had lost its hurricane characteristics, but it was still uh, very impactful. Um, we, we identified a, a software challenge with points in our forecast that are beyond you know, zero degrees. Uh, and I'd have to verify, but I believe we figured out a way to get around that so that we could actually have uh, points across there in our forecast. Uh, so we will forecast uh, out to five days as long as we think it's going to last as a cyclone, hurricane you know, or a tropical storm, tropical cyclone, or post-tropical cyclone or even remnant low. That five-day forecast goes out as far as, as need be. But 
what, what triggers us stopping advisories is when it's no longer a tropical cyclone and no longer a threat to land, or uh, once the threat of the post-tropical cyclone uh, to land goes away, or when the load just completely dissipates. Uh, we don't decide when to stop issuing advisories based on uh, you know, how far down the road the, the forecast points go, and we, we, I believe, have addressed that technical challenge. This is to Dr. Nab. Uh, Jennifer Zeppelin with Tulsa's Channel 8. Um, you were just talking about not being able to look back at, at past events to be able to predict what's going to be going on in the future. I mean, are you, I mean, in the future as we look at things, is, are things going to continue to be more extreme? Are we going to see more of these extremes occurring? Yeah, it, and, and again, to, to reemphasize what, what the point of, that I was making is that you, you can't use past history to, to tell you if you're going to get hit this year or not, or how soon it's going to be. What you can use history to teach is that it has happened before. I mean, we, we, I have this map on, in my office on the wall, and we have it online on hurricanes.gov, that shows you the track lines for all the tropical cyclones over the last 100 plus years. And you can't find anywhere on that map uh, in, in the eastern US that hasn't been affected. Uh, so that's what history can teach us. Uh, if you look back far enough, there have been devastating impacts in all the states from Texas to Maine, and then in a lot of inland areas. Uh, as for whether or not these landfalls or hurricane impacts in general are going to become more frequent, that is a harder question than answering other aspects of climate change, which are a little more apparent. Uh, and and the, there are many reasons for that. Um, for example, the, the, the historical record of hurricanes is, especially for the systems that were out to sea, uh, never struck land is, is incomplete prior to satellites, which have revolutionized our ability to document tropical cyclone activity and historical activity. Uh, but prior to satellites, we missed some and didn't really know what their intensities were. Uh, so we don't have a, a really, really long uh, data record to really clearly understand what the long-term behavior and changes have been up to this point, never mind try to forecast that in the future. So there's a lot of uncertainties because there are a lot of competing factors that would affect future hurricane activity. But one thing, or a couple things worry me, uh, that any hurricanes that do affect land areas, I'm concerned that the water impacts are going to get worse. If, you know, with sea level rise, then the impacts of storm surge would increase. Uh, look at the, 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 in, the inland rainfall impacts that we've seen. And you combine that with the, with the comment the previous gentleman made about increased populations in vulnerable areas. So uh, I think there are many reasons why the impacts will get worse. I just don't know if the frequency or the numbers or the intensities will get dramatically worse uh, in ways we can measure over the next few years or decades in terms of hurricanes. I have a question. Uh, this is Dave Jones with Storm Center. I just, and this kind of involves both of you, um, Greg and Rick. With the, with the volume of data that's going to be coming from GOES-R, is the National Hurricane Center and, and also other NCEP centers in the National Weather Service ready to ingest and use that data? And, and Rick, I'd be curious as to what do you think? I mean, there's so much new capability coming. How much time do you think it's going to take for forecasters and the Hurricane Center to get up to speed to really take advantage of all those products that are going to be available? I've got some specifics I could offer. You want to offer the general picture of how Weather Service and NOAA are preparing for the fire hose of data? Well, uh, early on in my program, I worked very closely with the Weather Service, because I started it when I was over there, of building a readiness, a goes our readiness program. And so over time, that's sort of evolved to uh, ground readiness, sort of they've broadened it, so their whole communication infrastructure. But uh, that's what I was talking to you yesterday about Luke Hanna re re leading that. They've got a lot of activities and AWIPs at all the service centers. They just issued a contract. I, th I think about they're going to put 18 direct readout antennas for Gozar around, certainly like at all the centers. So, and they'll have a, a, pr a product package with it. So in a sense, that's the fastest way to get it is that direct downlight because then you're making the product at the same time as this is and that uh, reduces the communication of moving it back and forth. Then it just becomes the internal of humans dealing with all the data. Right, and the Hurricane Center is going to be one of those sites. We're going to have, you know, it goes our receipt directly 
at, at our facility. In fact, one of our employees in our technology and science branch has been directly involved uh, with the agency-wide effort for the, the ground-based uh, receipt of the data uh, and working with other centers and other parts of the agency. So we've been directly involved in that aspect of it, uh, and we're, we're taking steps this year in that direction to have the, the dish. Uh, ready at the Hurricane Center and other centers and offices and locations are doing the same. And we've also been participating in uh, the Gozar Proving Ground in which we've brought our forecasters directly into the mix and evaluating Gozar products for their utility and operations. So we're doing a lot and then there's of course going to have to be the internal IT infrastructure piece to make sure we can process all of the data and get it into the forecasters' hands in a timely manner. The AWIPS 2 angle is part of that. So I think we're doing as best we can to address all those angles. So a quick follow-up to that. Um, you know, it, it's a, a very visual generation that's coming next after us. And um, one of the things that, I mean, just seeing the videos that you guys showed us today, um, this is the sort of thing that really captures one's imagination. I mean, it, it puts into your brain in a very rapid way, what would take you know, 15, 20 minutes of reading text. Um, so as these things happen, and, and as you get real-time information, how quickly can you get this, not only to the TV weather forecasters, but to the newspapers and to the other outlets in a way that they can put up on the web? Can this be done in hours, for example, in, in a way that would really you know, pull when, in when the When you say the this, generation? are you? I know which words the this end because from a from a observation I provide the observation right? right so I have very very strict timeliness requirements that I've got to move the data through my system process stuff and get it to the weather service literally within seconds right so I could get there right I can't talk to how the weather service uses it and creates their products so certainly from like the visible imagery and that type of stuff you know, that will be very rapidly available, you know. And, and again, that's driven because the day fire hose from the satellite's coming down, and I can't, I can't be too slow because it's going to back no, up. No, I, right. I understand that, but there's, uh, you know, one product is getting it for weather forecasting. Yes. But another product is getting those images out to the public. Right. So they can see those right Right. Away. Do you have an avenue for that, or does that happen well, through the weather well, service? Well, we're dependent. Or second, third hand posts? I think most of it is, is secondary, the, the commercial weather market that, They'll buy, my expectation is they'll buy the direct downlink just like the Weather Service has. We've put, you know, they're all working with us. You know, they're taking our simulators, testing their antenna systems, so that's there. So they'll be putting those all in place. Um, it'd probably be a good thing, especially with the broadcast community, to get us and you and them sort of tightly connected to make sure that there's, that's all moving very fast. But that, that, the speed of that will be very, very fast. Once they deliver it and then have to get it to various end users, then you have the communication um, limit as well. Uh, yeah, so this question is, is uh, specifically for, for Rick uh, regarding the storm surge warning and WMO RA4 responsibilities. Are, are we warning, uh, doing storm surge warnings for uh, the Caribbean and Mexico and so on and so forth? Oh, good question, John. Yeah, the, the storm surge watch warning effort including the experimental graphic for this year and, and then the more wide dissemination methods in 16 and 17 is U.S. CONUS only. Okay. And that is not to say, though, we're not engaging the international community on this. Next week, we are having a, a large collection of international folks from some of the other countries that have a storm surge workshop to map out how we and they can work together going forward to allow us as what is called the RSMC, the Regional Specialized Meteorological Center in this part of the world, uh, to work toward a place where we can provide some uh, more specific guidance and even public products uh, with regard to storm surge somewhat similar to what we've been doing uh, under development for the U.S. It would still be each individual country's responsibility to issue their own warnings, but we could get to the place where we could provide guidance for those warnings. So we are trying to take what we've learned in the U.S. and what we've been developing recently and expand that internationally. We've got some, some funding. Uh, that we uh, are in the process of, uh, uh, you know, tightening up and, and getting in-house and, and, and hiring some contractors to do some of the demonstration work to see if we can make this happen internationally. I have uh, one last online question, and this one's for Greg. Uh, sort of a follow-up question to the last one about infrastructure. How much data is GOES-R expected to create as compared to the current constellation? 
the, the, I think of it in data rates. The, uh, the data rate for the direct downlink today is like two megabits per second. The full downlink from uh, a Gozar is about 75 megabits per second. So that's just a raw data stream, uh, just as a rough comparison. So it's, it's roughly an order of magnitude more. Uh, Jim Cantori, Weather Channel. Dr. Nab, this is, this is for you. You know, given the fact that we had a pretty, really last couple of seasons, especially last one, uh, watched systems come from NHC's jurisdiction to the Honolulu uh, Hurricane Center. But it just seemed that there was quite a difference in, you know, the quality, if you will, of that. I mean, is there any way that you guys could take something all the way to Hawaii, especially if you're pretty much calling it first? Well, we uh, had some, uh, some visitors, including some folks from the uh, Central Pacific Hurricane Center at our annual NOAA hurricane meeting in December. Uh, met with a couple of them. Uh, we've got a couple of specific items on the table we want to start talking about more in depth and working on. Uh, one, I think, uh, low piece of hanging fruit that I think we could work with CPHC on is to uh, have a more consistent web presence. Uh, what's coming from NAC, what's coming from CPHC, so when things cross over, uh, there's not uh, a change in the user experience, uh, both in terms of content and, and, and the look and feel of it. And that, I think, can feed into the broader effort that the WFOs on the continental U.S. are working on to enhance their web presence. So I would like the web presence for tropical cyclones uh, to become more consistent agency-wide. Uh, and we as we always have for many years, uh, try to take everything that we are developing at NHC in terms of enhancements to our products and warnings and get that out to, to CPHC and have them implement it as fast as possible. So uh, all I can offer up is to is apply as many resources as I can scrounge up to, uh, to make the consistency as high as it can be, but it, it is a challenge the more we uh, apply resources at the Hurricane Center to change our products and advance things, it, it, that creates more things that we have to, to make sure get mimicked at CPHC. Uh, and that's a challenge, uh, but I'm going to keep working on that and do the best we can. Um, but the input from, you know, national media partners like yours is very valuable because you are looking at the very big picture. So uh, continue to let us know what your experience is. Great. Uh, Dr. Nab, Greg, thank you very much for participating in this uh, question and answer period.